Owl and snake, crocodile and bird, spider and frog, warthog and mongoose. You won't believe it, but these animals can be friends and benefit each other. Such a phenomenon is called symbiosis and is quite common in nature. Today I will tell you about the most unusual examples of animal symbiosis. And if you watch the video to the end, you'll learn about the aquatic creature that successfully cooperates with butterflies. Enjoy watching! The friendship between animals of different species has been shown on screens more than once. I think the biggest example of symbiosis in animation is Timon and Pumbaa. The characters of the mongoose and warthog aren't just made up. This pair is really friendly in the real world too. Take a look! Here's the mongoose, here's the warthog, and this is… um… the mongoose viciously attacking the warthog? Let's figure this out. This pair lives in the African savanna. Once, Ugandan scientists witnessed a very strange interaction between two completely different animals. Warthogs not only didn't attack mongooses, but also purposely laid down on the ground so that the mongooses approached them first. It's like surrendering before the duel even begins. It turned out that this interaction was beneficial for both species. Warthogs received a skin cleaning service from mongooses. And sharp-toothed mongooses got a meal, because they ate various insects from this skin, which they simply adore. By the way, this phenomenon also has its scientific name – mutualism. It's a type of symbiosis where both partners benefit from the interaction process. Timon gets food and Pumbaa gets rid of annoying parasites. So it's not a vicious mongoose attack on the poor warthog in this picture. The warthog is just enjoying the procedures. Not only animals, but also birds and fish can act as cleaners. In general, the type of interaction where one species removes parasites from another and the other is happy that these parasites are gone is quite common. For example, oxpeckers are birds that live in the African savanna. They eat insects living in the fur of buffaloes, giraffes, impalas and other large mammals. Removing fleas, lice and ticks is beneficial care for these animals because pests not only annoy with their constant itching, but can also cause various infections and diseases. Moreover, this bird is helpful for the buffalo and for another reason. When it sees a predator threatening the herd, it immediately starts emitting a loud warning signal. And here in these shots, you can see these same birds, oxpeckers, helping hippos, removing those same parasites. Hippos, by the way, are a bit luckier in this regard. They have other helpers – fish specifically a small fish called black lobius. They also clean the hippo's skin while it's in the water, and hippos spend most of their lives in the water. Here I can't help but remember the famous Moto Moto. By the way, black lobios not only help with the skin, they often swim into the mouths of these large predators directly. Why? To perform dental procedures there, clean the teeth and gums. Though I have some bad news for these dentists. Hippos feed on fish. So hippos will help them too, of course. There is a plant, well, not exactly a plant, called an anemone. If you don't understand what's confusing about it, take a look for yourself. It looks like a real plant, but it's not. Uh, let me explain. The average recipe for this unusual animal, yes, animal, goes like this. Take a round base, attach a columnar body 4 inches long to it, then add tentacles with venomous stinging cells like jellyfish. And then scatter this thing all over the ocean. Done. Yes, I agree, it's a really strange creature that, moreover, can't move at all. Here's where we'll remember symbiosis. Anemones are very friendly with various arthropods. For example, with boxer crabs. <laughs> what a funny name! But I understand where it came from. Remember I mentioned that anemones are venomous? They have special tentacles that release a toxic substance. So, these clever crabs pick up anemones and carry them in their claws for protection against predators. Because if the predator attacks, you can deliver a right hook straight to the eye and leave the attacker blind. Meanwhile, the interaction between these two animals is still considered mutualism, meaning it benefits both participants in the interaction. Anemones get mobility thanks to the crabs, which they lack. Well, that's not all. When I said these animals are friendly, I really meant they can live in peace and harmony with many other organisms. 
For some fish species, like clownfish, anemones allow them to come very close and even settle in their tentacles. And then it protects them from enemies with its venom, which is not dangerous at all for the clownfish. And in return, it gets a cleaner, actively caring for its new home. It removes various debris, parasites, eats infected tissues and ventilates the water. This is one of the most productive symbioses in nature. While I haven't strayed far from marine topics yet, let me tell you about another interesting example of mutualism among ocean dwellers. Do you ever feel lazy to move? Sometimes I really don't feel like getting out of bed to go to work. A similar feeling is familiar to clingfish. These lazy creatures are so reluctant to move on their own that they regularly hitch a ride on some water taxi to get to their destination. Interestingly, clingfish most often choose a shark for this purpose. Yes, you heard it right, this formidable predator that could easily devour them. But it doesn't, because the ramara, another name for this fish, cleans its host from parasites, sometimes even sneaking into its mouth for that purpose. Because if bacteria remain on the skin, it can cause irritation or lead to infection. Such a portable doctor! In addition to transportation, the clingfish also gets food from the shark. It eats all the leftovers of the predator's prey, temporarily detaching from it. An interesting alliance, isn't it? Considering that the remora itself could become prey. If the clingfish accidentally mistakes the shark species, for example, settling on a lemon or sand shark instead of a white one, it will undoubtedly be eaten because these types of sharks are not thrilled about such cohabitation. Get into a crocodile's mouth? Easy! That's the motto of a certain African bird. It's called the Egyptian plover, or alternatively, crocodile's watchdog. Back in the 5th century BCE, the Greek historian Herodotus witnessed an unusual scene in the Egyptian deserts. A small bird flew into the mouth of a crocodile, and it didn't snap its jaws shut even allowing the bird to pick at its teeth and calmly fly away. Later, more witnesses of something similar appeared. Well, what can I say? Here's the photo. Tangible evidence. Some scientists suggested that this is an example of mutualism among animals. The bird picks food scraps from the crocodile's mouth, and the crocodile gets free oral hygiene. But in reality, this predator doesn't need teeth cleaning. It only opens its mouth to catch more flies, not to visit a dentist. After all, its teeth are replaceable. When the old ones wear out and fall out, new ones grow in their place right away. A crocodile can easily replace each tooth at least 50 times throughout its life. And it's absolutely free! If only I could do that. But what about the bird? Why doesn't the crocodile eat it? It's simple. It still benefits the crocodile. The Egyptian plover indeed enjoys feasting on food scraps from the crocodile's mouth. So it builds its nest right next to the crocodile's nest. If it sees a threat, it acts as a watchman. It cries loudly, and then the crocodile rushes to defend its offspring. Take a look at this photo. It seems like it was taken just a second before a tragedy. Well, before a huge spider devoured a small frog. However, fortunately, it's far from the truth. You might ask, why fortunately? After all, the spider will remain hungry. It's all about my personal preferences. I prefer frogs over spiders. These hairy creatures don't interest me at all. So how come the frog is not of interest to the spider as prey? It's all because the offspring of bird-eating spiders or tarantulas is completely defenseless. Well, just think about it. Can eggs defend themselves? That's when this formidable predator decides to get itself an assistant, who wouldn't mind feasting on easy prey and scrolling towards the spider's eggs to eat them. The tarantula finds such an alliance very profitable, so it even welcomes this cohabitation and protects its frog from other predators. That's an example of defensive symbiosis. However, I'm sorry to disappoint you, sometimes the spider forgets itself and still eats its indispensable assistant or not so indispensable. It's true what they say, there are no indispensable employees. What can you do? Hire a new one. Despite everything I've told you earlier, scientists have discovered that birds very rarely enter into symbiosis with other living creatures. However, they still do. So now you'll find out why North American owls put snakes in their nests. Imagine, you've flown out hunting, 
brought a bunch of mice and large beetles to your chicks, and your prey is stolen by parasites that have settled in the nest, leaving your offspring hungry. Can you imagine it? Well, you don't need to imagine it, but the owl does. But it found a solution to this problem. It invited, or rather dragged, a little blind snake into its dwelling, which only eats small insects. As a result, everyone benefited. The tiny blind snake, which now finds it easier to find food, and the owl with his chicks, who are no longer threatened with starvation. Moreover, scientists have proven that chicks in such a nest grow much faster and become more resilient. So, this symbiosis turned out to be very beneficial for both parties. In nature, organisms never exist in isolation. They are always in interaction. I've shown you some examples of the most productive form of animal relationships – mutualism. However, there is also commensalism. I'll tell you about it later. But for now, I want to reflect on the threats to symbiosis. Climate change is pretty straightforward. Due to changes in habitat, some species of interacting animals are moving apart and can no longer assist each other in various processes. But what about humans? Can they pose a threat to the symbiosis of certain animal species? My answer – yes. And now I'll show you a vivid example. This is the honey guide, a small bird that always knows where honey is. The only problem is it can't get to it, although it loves it very much. The issue lies with the aggressive bees. They have a tendency to sting anything that unlawfully enters their home, including the cheeky bird's face. And the honey guide really wants to live, so it can't do without outside help. It came up with a clever trick. It can attract the attention of someone who can help. For example, a human by loud cries, and gradually lead them to the honey stash. Then the human breaks the hive, the bees fly away, and the honey guide can feast on the honey leftovers. This plan worked perfectly. You might ask, what does this have to do with threats to symbiosis? Hardly anyone besides humans would think to follow a loudly screaming bird. But it turns out that previously, the honey guide's frequent assistant was the honey badger, and humans simply hosted it in its tough business. And now the honey badger remains hungry. This is one example of how human intervention in natural ecosystems can lead to the disruption of animal symbiotic relationships. I won't even mention environmental pollution or habitat destruction. That's already quite obvious. And now, let me tell you about commensalism. It turns out that symbiosis doesn't necessarily mean both participants benefit immediately. This term is also applicable when only one organism benefits while the other is not harmed. Here are several examples. I won't dwell on each of them in detail. In this photo, we see sparrows chasing a pheasant to feast on the flies it will stir up into the air. Here, an Egyptian heron follows an Asian buffalo for the same purpose. It also doesn't mind feasting on insects stirred up by a large predator passing through vegetation. And here's a hyena trailing behind a lion. The king of beasts leaves food scraps after its meal, and the hyena doesn't mind picking them up. This is perhaps the most common type of interaction in commensalism. One leaves food it no longer needs, and then another finishes it. But there's another type I'll call camouflage. Some small fish live on other marine animals, changing their color to blend in with the host, thereby gaining protection from predators. Quite unusual. And now? I've saved the most beautiful example of symbiosis for dessert. So, are you ready finally to find out why a butterfly drinks a turtle's tears? There's no mystery here. A scientist from the research center at Peruvian Reserve, after observing this beautiful phenomenon for some time, concluded, butterflies in this region simply lack some minerals, namely salts, because all the water in local forests is fresh. So, the butterflies drink the turtles' tears. You might ask, but if the water is fresh, where do the turtles get salt? It's simple. They are carnivores and get such macro elements from animal food. Butterflies, on the other hand, feeds only on plants, which prompts them to seek an additional source of vitamins. Such a phenomenon is quite common in nature. For example, some parrots lick clay and monkeys eat soil. However, replenishing the lack of minerals with the tear fluid of another animal is found only in the Amazon rainforests. Nevertheless, one mystery remains unsolved. Why do the poor turtles cry? Take care of nature, as it hides so many amazing secrets. 
That's all from me. Thanks for watching.